Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays for another episode of Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. And in the last stream we had a big leap forward where we managed to start making the matter science. So that's been a, a big jump, a, a big advancement in our, in our science production. However, there's been a little bit more to it than that, so let's go back a little bit further and see how things went. The first thing I needed to do was get the um, get the modules up and running because, as you may remember, for the material fabricators which are required to make the matter science, I needed tier six um, efficiency modules. That's these ones that come out here, and also uh, speed modules, which is these ones that come out here. And so I've managed. We had last time there were some problems with the supplies coming in. We had a shortage of um, all of the iridium. Um, products and it looks like we've still got a bit of a shortage of these ones over here but I've given that a bit of a boost over here we've now I've now increased some of the numbers over here on this on this um, uh, combinator to say I want larger quantities of all of these things coming through and it seems that two even 2,000 heavy girders and uh, one and a half thousand heavy bearings still not well, actually, no, I was going to say it's not enough, but the train is unloading right now and bringing some more in to refill it. So, actually, it looks like that maybe I've got it exactly right and that these numbers are working quite well. Uh, so, those can all be fed up into here, and then as they, as they come through, we've got the supply of iridium plates pours in here to allow me to make the tier fours, and there should be some... Oh, yeah, and once it's fed enough through, then this inserter can also grab a couple of these modules as well, which we are currently very, very short of, it seems. Feed them into here will make and allow us to make the tier four modules. Then in here, it's the same thing again. We need the, the tier 4 module except we need the tier 4 modules to make the tier 5s and large quantities 100 heavy girders to make those that's why there's so much load on there and then over here we need 140 heavy bearings and two of the speed modules and so on and so on and so there's there's massive loads been put on all of the all of the iridium products but it seems like we have a decent amount of it flowing through at the moment this is all going quite well Similarly, up here with the energy, we need lots and lots of the Holmium stuff coming through, and we seem to run out of the Holmium cables, which is a bit of a shame. Hopefully we'll get a train through fairly soon to deliver some here, and it looks like we've run out of the Holmium solenoids as well, because this belt is only, it is, um, it's only half full where it comes out here. Up here with the biologicals, well, things are ticking over okay. I mean, we have, as you see, a train is leaving there. We have quite a lot of the resources in here, in, in, in good healthy numbers, but we're missing the epoxy. Um, and so this means that over here we're able to build the, the tier 4, 5 and 6 of the productivity modules but we're struggling with 7s because we don't have enough of the epoxy as I said so we've got up to we've got up to the full 50 of these and for each of these modules we're aiming to have we're aiming to load it up until we hit 50 of that module and that's the same for absolutely all of them and then we're only taking on the other side when there's at least 5 in there so there should always be at least 5 modules in about 5 modules in here and never never any more than 50 so it's the idea the idea behind this is that we will always have enough for bots to come flying in and grab the higher tier modules if they're needed somewhere else but also we won't build up too many of them in here because especially the later tier modules they're really quite expensive and so over here you can see we've got seven of these um these tier seven mod uh, productivity modules over here and having been able to make the tier seven productivity modules, that means we've now gone over and put and, and put them into the um, in, into the labs over here. So these are now full of tier sevens, except for that one tier uh, tier nine that we got out of a, uh, a pyramid. I say we, I got out of a pyramid quite a long time ago. So now we've got these these um, labs running at a productivity of plus 120 percent so it's running it it's doing double efficiency double effectiveness so for every um, science pack that goes into it we're getting more than two science packs worth of research done and over here on this one this one's only at 116 because it did we we only got one tier 9 productivity module but that shows that even the tier 7s are still really really good Tristan has also done a big upgrade here he's upgraded all of the modules in the beacon up to being tier um, tier six by the looks of it and so that's me means that now these buildings are also not only are they um productivity now up to the um uh, up to a very very high level they're also running at plus uh, plus twelve hundred percent um so are running at a research speed of 67 and a bit each oh uh, okay 65 nearly 66 on this one 67 and a bit on this one so these are absolutely blazing through the research and it will remain to be seen whether we can actually produce the uh, science packs quickly enough to keep up with it and uh, looking at these tier four um, biological science uh, packs dribbling through, dribbling through here, I'm going to say no. We appear to not be able to produce the science packs at the rate we need. Do you see that at the rate we need them at. So um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we'll keep running, keep keep it keep we'll keep it running. But we may have to switch away from this med pack four and go over to do something that uses maybe the biological um, or the. I was going to say all the um, the astro. We seem to run out of astro two for some reason, which is um, odd. That seems like an odd thing to have run out of. Um, 
yeah, we appear to have, yeah we've run out of we've run out of lots of the beryllium products over here, so we haven't got the sticks and we haven't got the um, the these things. Maybe that's an emesite shortage. We'll we'll look into that another time. But yes, there are some definite shortages going on over here, and that's going to need to be looked at. However, that has dragged me away rather from the uh, from the module systems that I've been trying to talk about over here. Getting all of the resources in in in, 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 in sufficient quantities um, has meant I, I ended up needing to put in this manufactory here. So beforehand we had a, a an assembly machine in tucked in the gap up here that was pulling in the ingots and then chucking out plates but even with speed modules in it was far too slow so now we've got a, a manufactory down here that's pulling in the uh, pulling in the ingots I've used a an inserter here so that uh, and a, and a brake on the belt here so this so this is connected to the uh, to the warehouse and when there is less than 500 plates in the warehouse this inserter will kick in and I had to switch this for an inserter rather than a loader because if otherwise the the as soon as there's less than 500 we get an absolute pouring through of these because the a loader will load up as many as you possibly can into the machine and so then you get a massive overrun and it's, it's just it's a little bit silly so I thought no we'll stick a stack inserter in there that'll keep things a little bit more sensible and we'll uh, we'll just do 10 ingot or 12 ingots at a time in, into 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 here. So we've got yeah, we've got a decent number of the iridium plates and this seems to be seems to be holding together quite nicely. The other two were a bit more complicated. So over here Tristan has a train that bimbles around merrily going to uh looking for quantum processor drop stations and then I think this train uh yes, it goes down to goes down to Norvis. It picks up an inventory full of stuff. Uh and then there seems to be a train here that has run out of fuel. That's rather unfortunate. Um but anyway, it picks up an inventory full of stuff and then and then tries to find a quantum processor, uh, goes to quantum processor pickup to see if it can find any. And then goes and finds a quantum processor drop or an energy extras drop like this one. Which one's this? This is a quantum processor drop. And then we'll attempt to unload there with anything that's left over. So it's... It's not a system that seems to be working particularly well, and I'm very, very tempted to switch this train that stops over here to pulling in the Holmium Intermediates as well, because I feel like it might work a bit better. Uh, Tristan assures me that's not necessary, but I think he might be wrong, given that this has stopped. Uh, <laughs> yes. The biological one is also another weird one. So this this is run into the problem of everyone doing things a bit differently. So um, I ignored the way that Mike has been bringing up um, intermediates to orbit because I don't think he has been. Uh, and so I just built up my own system. And that's working fine because I understand it. Tristan had built up a different system that works in a different way. And that's not working. Um, and I'm not quite sure why because I don't understand it. Mark has built up another another different system in another another different way. This one has a train that goes to goes over to the um goes over to the the, the drop off area from the spaceships, picks up stuff, and then it has a load of stations of various different priority levels, and it will visit each one of those in turn with a mixture of stuff in there, and then hopefully unload some of it wherever it gets to. So at the moment, it's going to the bioscience station drop, um, and it'll it'll go over there. It'll unload. Whatever is um, whatever is appropriate for this area, um, which seems to be um, nothing at all, uh, because okay, we don't have anything other than Vita Roast. It looks like at the moment. Um, so then it's going to leave this station, come over to mine, where we don't need that at all. And so this is this is down to a problem where, with it going over to the the, um, the spaceship over here, and then apparently oh, this isn't. I, I don't know. It's, it's trying to get. Oh, it's trying to get vitalic epoxy, but there isn't any, so it's not getting loaded with any. But it's already got some of the uh, the vita the vita melange spice in it, so it's just carrying that around, offering it to everywhere, and nothing is working. Um, so this system would probably work if we had a sufficient supply of everything, but we don't, so it's not working. So. Um, yeah, so that's broken as well. Now, at the moment, we do currently have a sufficient a sufficiency over here of everything, of all of the other things, except for the epoxy. So this is basically working. It just means the train is running around endlessly trying to drop off things wherever they're needed. But that does mean that if we do make some of the mid-tier... Um, productivity modules and so here we're using up the extract for example if we run out of that we will then send a signal out on the on the network system and it will then call for more extract um, to be put into the train and so it is basically it is kind of going to work it's just a little bit weird and I'm not uh, I, I don't know I don't like systems that involve trains just running backwards and forwards endlessly because it seems a little bit it seems it seems wasteful, both both because it creates extra extra congestion on the railway system, and because it um, and because it wastes power and going into the batteries and wastes batteries when they when they eventually die. So I mean it's it's not a big deal really. Uh, none of these things are particularly serious, but it still feels like something we should be trying to avoid. And here is the train that has run out of batteries. That's a that's a shame. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to fix that next next stream before it causes any problems. Uh, if not, somebody is bound to be in uh, Norbit and can go over and shove some batteries in it.
yeah, we, so we need to have a look at this actually. Why has this failed? So it's, okay, it's run out of batteries and it's filled up with dead batteries. But that's the science train. So that comes to here. And it's true, there are no batteries being fed in or out. But it's been running for ages and not had any problems. So I'm kind of surprised. Does it, does it unload at the other, successfully at the other end? Does it recharge at the other end? No. Okay, I'm very surprised it's kept going as long as it has before this has become a problem. But we'll, 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 we'll take a look at that. We'll fix it. That's okay. The other big thing that I've implemented over here that I think is worth talking about is something that I was hinting at last week um, when I, I noticed that the train was coming up, wasn't coming up here even when we'd run out of stuff. And so I've implemented the design I was talking about there. So what I've done, firstly, I've put the... Um, I put the, the connections over here on the other side of, an, of a combinator and this arithmetic combinator is simply adding zero to everything and passing it through. So it's just a pass through to make sure that these num the numbers in this constant combinator don't get fed back the other way and over to here. And so that means on these inputs here we've got positive numbers of everything because that's what we've got available. And But on the other side if we look at this pylon we have negative numbers of some of the things where we would like to have more of them. So for example the, um, the girders we've got minus about 900 of them at the moment because we have fewer than we would like and that's how the shopping list system works. But on the input to this, we've got 1,100 of them because that's how many we've actually really got. And so what I've done over here is I copied this combinator, this constant combinator over to here and then changed all of the numbers to minus one of each. So if we actually fully run out of, well, any of the things, then we'll get a negative then we will get a negative number on there but otherwise we won't because these massive negative numbers aren't getting fed over and then this one over this combinator watches for anything being less than zero and if any of those get to less than zero which means it's run out completely and then we've had the minus one there then it sends this one arrow launch signal which is an arbitrary signal I picked out because it looked appropriate. That is sent down in the signal down to Norvis and then received by the signal receiver and passed through in, through here and then this train here is told to leave if the if it gets an arrow launch signal of greater than zero and it's inactive which means that if the train is not currently loading and space has run out of something, anything, the train will immediately depart because clearly there is a problem. And if we look in here, we can see that there is quite a lot of stuff in here, but the train isn't full. So if we, if we hypothetically speaking, had now run out of green circuits, well, we'd have a lot more green circuits in there. But if we had, the train would be automatically dispatched. And so we would then make sure that the train is always, always leaves if there is a problem, even if we haven't managed to fill it up yet. And this works fantastically. It, I've seen it trigger a couple of times, and it's brilliant when it does, because it solves one of those big problems that we've always had with these sort of systems. Uh, and I can't believe it took me this long to implement it. And I'm now thinking that well, we should probably go through and implement it on any of the other trains where we see this problem. It's not going to be for a little while, I think. Most of the trains do seem to be okay. And Tristan has, I know Tristan has fixed at least one of them for the, I think it was for the energy science, by increasing some of the numbers to make sure more stuff gets brought through. Oh, and here's the um, Holmium Intermediate train coming down to uh, to load up on some on some things. But yeah, I think, I think I would quite like to start feeding those through onto these belts and into this train as well, just to get that working a bit better. And so having those modules has meant that I've been able to put in this manufactory up here, which is building the uh, the, the uh, material fabricators, they're called, isn't it? Yes, material fabricators. And those, well, we're trying to build up a stockpile of five of them. So this this is to, this is told to limit whenever there's at least five in the uh, limit. Stop stop running if there's if, if if we get to five of the um, five material fabricators in storage. But we're running into a bit of a problem with it because, as you can see here, we don't have any efficiency module sixes. We need to bring them over here. I'm doing all of this by logistics robot, which feels a, a bit gross. It's something I try to avoid. But given that the ingredients ingredients for this are all sort of advanced building type things. It seems a bit weird to have them all on belts. I and mean, they're all being built in this tower, so the bots aren't bringing them all that far, except for the modules which are being made uh, quite a long way all the way over here. So those do get transported quite a long way, but they're so expensive, there's no way I'm going to be shoving a belt a belt of them over here or filling up a train with them or anything like that. Uh, I think they basically need to be brought over by, uh, by bot. And so, so far we've made eight of them apparently, and then we ran out of modules. Over here we've got the efficiency module running but yes it's that it's that um, Holmium cable problem that I was talking about earlier so I think I need to I, as, as I was saying I need to get the Holmium cables brought over then it'll be solved and we'll be able to make some more of those so those are being made up here all the bits and pieces are being brought in by bots they're being made and then they're being dropped off into a red chest here which means they can then be sent down here to the bottom of the energy science thing where I can start using them so now to have all this stuff I can start building all of the things I've been talking about for 
ages. And so over here we've got well we've got three machines that are making um, making the superconductive cables. That's the first first thing that was needed, and that's made from apparently cryonite and holmium cables. We have a few holmium cables over here at least. So those are being passed into these machines, which seem to be a bit slow. I might have to chuck a load of um, uh, speed modules into these, or maybe a beacon in the middle of here somewhere, since these seem to be quite slow as well. And then as those run, the superconductive cables get then turned into these uh, little pot things, uh, magnetic canisters, because when we're bringing in the uh, the secure canisters from the ground, as you might remember from previous videos along with various other things like batteries and, and rare metals, which I think I think Tristan already had the rare metals. Those are then getting fed into here where they can be um, uh, combined with this, this sort of this London Eye data, what's it actually called, um, with the force field data. It can be combined with the magnetic canisters and also with pressure containment data. That was an interesting one to get hold of, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. And some particle stream, which was already more or less on site. I just had to run some pipes for that. And then that spills out the bottom here. We get with, along with lots and lots of scrap. So I've got a simple splitter here. Now the interesting thing about this is we do produce three different types of, of junk. So the junk data cards and the scrap and contaminated scrap. But because of the way we've built our recycling facility, that doesn't matter. We can just chuck it all onto one belt. It'll all get taken away down to the recycling facility where it'll all get sorted out and dealt with nicely over there. So it's been really, really that's been really nice. It's been really easy to separate off the microwave or bacon or whatever that data is to come out round here to be passed on down to the next stage. It's been absolutely trivial to do so because everything else can just go down this disposal chute. It's, fa it's fantastic. The next one to brings in um, orange boxes and uh, fiery data and radiation data and more particle stream and then again produces one of the data types. This, this time it's uh, matter liberation data apparently and three different types of junk. It's different three different types of junk from the previous one because we're producing broken data cards instead of scrap. But again it doesn't matter because the recycling facilities will do all of the sorting on site. So we just chuck it all over there. They can deal with it there and yeah it's great. Everything will just work. I, I really like the, uh, the, the system we've got running over there works really well. We do seem to have run out of fire data though, which is a bit unfortunate. Then down here we've got a... we are using um, another type of... An another bringing in another one of the energy data, the quark data this time, uh, plus the particle streams. And again, it's very, very similar. Um, the main difference here is this one uses uh, thermofluid. So this required a bit of shenaniganery with the pipework. Because normally the way I build these things is if they've got, if they've got one fluid going in, then I'll if I've got one fluid going in, I'll free feed it in at the bottom or to the top. It doesn't matter which, and then I can sort of put more and more and more of these machines across and have and have the, just have the pipes extend across and feed into all the machines. Great, and they can be as close as you want. And if there's only what actually literally only one fluid involved, then you can put them right up against each other like that, which is fine. The next type is where you have liquid in, liquid out. So this one has cold, super chill thermofluid comes in, and then cool thermofluid comes out. Uh, that's fine. You have a pipe on the top, pipe on the bottom, no problem there. And you can actually put these machines right next to each other by rotating it uh, appropriately like that. So you then butt the uh, the super chilled up together and and the cool cool up together on the other side. However, I haven't done that along here um, because the extra pipes are the, the pipes feeding in are coming off these pipes, which are already in place, and I thought I might as well just borrow them. Um, so these machines could be closer together, but they don't really need to be. The next possibility, though, is rather is rather more awkward. This one has three liquids involved. So it takes in it takes in the um, the, the pink clouds here and here. So both both the machines take it in, and then down here it brings in this super chilled thermofluid and kicks out warm thermofluid. So we've got two, we've got three different fluids involved. Um, and so my my first thought was okay, that's fine. We'll we'll put two of them together. We'll link them, nudge this one across a bit so we can have the um, the warm coming out in, in in the same place. So they they can both pour the warm out into a single central pipe, and then on the other side we'll have the super chilled coming in. Then we'll rotate the other one so we can have the super chilled coming in on there as well and, that'd be, and it'll be absolutely fine but of course that doesn't work because it, that would mean that every, I'd have to rotate flip it round each time and we'd end up with the uh, clouds going in in a, in a funny place so in the end I thought let's not bother with a pipe at the bottom let's just run the let's just make them all exactly the same rather than trying to make them flip together and share pipes and stuff like that and so we'll just feed the, the super chilled in up, up, the, up the left hand side bring out the warm down the right hand side it just works like this it's nice and simple it's it's much easier than trying to do any other sort of funny business with it the other slight complication I did run into with it, though, is uh, is with these pipe length lengths along here. I had to make sure that the um, these two single pieces of pipe here and these two single pieces of pipe here weren't next to each other, and that was easily enough fixed by putting in this uh, nine piece here and the and the and the five piece here, rather than. Um, rather than putting the nine across here and then the two two singles on the end where they'd have joined with these ones. But it was an extra thing I had to think about. 
And speaking of thinking about things, one thing I forgot to mention is that some of these machines, this one in particular, brings in particle stream but also passes out particle stream. And not only does it pass out particle stream, it actually passes out more than it brings in, which is absolutely ridiculous and how on earth are you supposed to deal with that? Fortunately, uh, the other machines around here will take in, this one for example, will take in 100 particle stream and not give any back. So when they're all running, it's going to be absolutely fine. We're not going to be generating any overall. But I did have to make sure that this pipe here would never be full because we've got a load coming out of these machines. And I was thinking, oh dear, am I going to have to put in a, a buffer tank here? But no, it turns out that where Tristan's got it done loading, there is always going to be some buffer available in these tanks um, because the train turns up when the tanks are quite empty and doesn't fill them up all the way to the top. So there's always going to be a bit of space left in those. So that can be my buffer. And these pipes are never quite full. They're always at about sort of 35, 30, 30, 30 to 40 percent. So that system does just work quite nicely. Uh, there is another one down here that brings in and, and get take, passes out um, particle stream, but it brings in 50 and puts out 35, so that's not a problem. That one will basically be okay all by itself. And again, it's a similar sort of recipe. You bring in, um, in this case, it's the, another orange box, two types of um, energy data and particle stream, and you spit out the card you want, two types of data, two types of junk, but again, the junk can just be passed away on, on the belt here. I do notice that this is yet another different combination of junk being passed out, so does that mean they are actually literally all different? Did I check this one? Uh, yes, they are literally all different. Just to, just to, give, to um, create a headache for anybody who tries to sort their um, their junk on the on the way out. Um, but fortunately, we don't do that, so it's um, it's relatively straightforward. And then in the way you'll be used to from basically every single other um, uh, science catalogue we've been making in the past, you feed the four types of data cards into your computers down here at the bottom. They'll be taken in by the uh, the research servers and cooked up and turned into the catalogues, which are then passed out along a belt here. And this gets fed into a, into a train system here. And this is pretty much as far as I've got. Um, they are being fed over here into, into the train system. Uh, we're loading up over here. As you can see, we've got like 110 of them made so far. Not a huge number, but, you know, we're getting there. It's gradual. We, we are making them steadily. And so that means we're then ready to move on in the next uh, in the next step. We'll be to move on to make the actual... Um, uh, actual mat matter science packs and these are again fairly similar to um, other systems we've made so as usual you pull in uh, a matter catalog you don't pull in an insight for this one you pull in particle stream instead so that's going to be a minor complication which we can sort out that's fine you pull in the significant data that's absolutely fine we have loads of it available over there we can just pull it off on the belt but you also bring in 10 scrap, so the, the exotic material, in inverted commas, that you bring in for matter science is scrap, and that's really weird. So, yeah, the whole system, this and the material science and everything, is producing massive, massive quantities of scrap. Generating scrap, not so much of a problem, but bringing it over to be passed into, this, in, into the uh, science system is a bit weird. And so, Tristan was kind enough to build up a station up here that is filling up with scrap. We've got a warehouse that fills up with 5,000 scrap. Okay, that, that's, that is a quantity. That's, that's a, it's, a, it's a good amount. So that'll fill up nicely. It's being brought in here. It's been prioritised to go down here just so we make sure we've always got 5,000 of it available. And the amount of scrap we generate, this should not be a problem, I don't think. I even noticed that some of it is actually being not prioritised and is being passed out this way. And he hasn't even done anything clever with belts. He's just assuming that there's going to be so much scrap coming through that we're always going to have plenty coming down here. And I'm, I think he's going to be right. I don't, I don't see any dangers with this. And so the scrap is being fed into a train, uh, which goes to the scrap pickup station. And I did the maths and I worked out that for each stack of these, because matter catalog stacks to, well, because catalogs in general all stack to 50, and scrap stacks to uh, 50 as well. But because we use 10 uh, scrap for each matter, uh, matter catalog we use up, we're going to need, for every stack of these, we're going to need 10 stacks of scrap, which is why it's arranged like this. Uh, so this means we'll take we'll take along um, 40 stacks of scrap and 4 stacks of matter catalogs, and then when we get to the other end and can sort it all out and use it, use it for science and so on, we'll have the right proportions coming in each time the train arrives. I've also sneakily looked ahead a little bit, and when we get on to Matter Science 2 as well, I'm going to be able to take out two of these catalogues across here and turn them into Matter Catalog 2s, and the ratios will still be the same because you still need 10, um, you need, you need 10 scrap for each Matter Catalog 1 you bring in, and you need 10 scrap for each Matter Catalog 2 that goes through. Um, now, I haven't balanced between the Matter Catalogs 1 and Matter Catalogs 2 because that way lies madness. Uh, however, I think this is probably going to be reason sufficiently well balanced. Um, however, this does mean that each time the train runs, it will only be taking over 100 Matter Catalogs instead of the uh, 500 of each catalogue that are taken over by, for example, this train. You see we've got 500 of each one in here. Um, so it's going to be... 
not quite as... It's, it's, the train's going to have to run a lot more, but it is also taking over the intermediate that is required as well. We are also going to have to bring over uh, purple clouds, but that's, that's, that's fine because they're being made over here on mass, and this train can just head over and dump them off there. That's, that's absolutely fine. That isn't a problem. Um, the, scrap isn't, the scrap is not a serious problem, but it was a bit of a what when we saw it, because we're so used to scrap being a byproduct that you immediately want to recycle and turn into other stuff, that the idea of then turning it, it being an actual essential component for something seemed very strange indeed. But, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it was entertaining and, and a novel and different. So, I mean, I, I have no complaints about it whatsoever. It, I, I like things that sort of upend my, the way I'm thinking about things and make me think about them in a slightly different way. So, yeah, I, I approve of that. It's weird, but in the good way. There are a few side notes of things to point out on the way through here, uh, in, the making of, in the making of all these, uh, these matter catalogues down here. One thing I want to draw attention to is the sheer power draw of these of these material fabricators. So they pull in 250 me 258 megawatts each, and you can't even put um, efficiency modules in them to make them to put to pull that down a little bit. So if we look at the power graph over the last um, hour or so, you can see um, actually it doesn't look that bad. Oh, here we go. Here's the, here's the material fabricators. You can see the, we're getting some fairly crazy spikes out of it, but we haven't had these running flat out yet. So we, yeah, we've seen some spikes up to sort of 800 megawatts, but we haven't had all of them running flat out. And I think I'm probably going to need to put more machines, more of these machines in as well. So this is going to be using a lot of the power. Um, over the last hour, it has used an average of 274 megawatts. That's a, that's somewhat. Um, it's not a very helpful way of looking at it, but if I if I turn off the filter again, you can see that this has spiked up to uh, 962 megawatts here. That is more than anything else has been using in the past. Anything else would be using now when they all kick in. And I say that because yes, okay, the particle accelerators are currently use well have used 3.2 gigawatts at one point, but Tristan then went out and gave them some more efficiency modules and higher tier ones as well at that. So that's pulled that down quite a long way. I don't know how much of this is the machines turning off and how much of it is the machines using less power but right now the amount the particle accelerators we are using 740 megawatts and in the past the the um uh, the, the the material fabricators have been using 960 so yeah um hang on that's an electrolysis plant oh i don't know they're in here somewhere um, 800 uh, i'm having a little bit of trouble finding the crazy spikes but i think when we expand it out it's going to be very very easy to find them and as i say we can't even module them to calm them down a little bit Fortunately, we have an enormous array of solar up here, a lot of which has been upgraded to red, and some of it is still in the process of being upgraded. But at the moment, we do have quite a lot of headroom in the power. We have 40 gigawatts available. Oh, that's because I turned cheaty mode on. When, if we look back, and, and um, uh, so generation has, will have spiked up the amount. I've got, I've got the lights turned on to make it easier for you guys to see, and that means all the solar powers. Solar panels are producing twice as so much power as they normally would. So actually, it's only 20 gigawatts, but still, that is quite a lot. I think I'm probably going to want to put some some system for producing dropping these uh, superconductive cables out onto onto a train because I'm pretty sure we're going to need these in elsewhere in the future. Uh, we haven't yet, but I think at some point we probably will. Maybe on the bus for making advanced machines, something like that. But I'm pretty sure we're going to need them somewhere. So I think this is going to need to be expanded massively, massively beacon, massively speed moduled, just made generally better and quicker and faster and stronger. And then we'll feed and then we'll feed some of them out down on, onto a onto a train over here that can then take them away to wherever they're needed. I was a little bit horrified to discover that this step produces cool thermofluid rather than warm thermofluid. Fortunately, it, was, it wasn't too difficult to run down an extra pipe, but it's quite distracting when you're expecting warm to come out of basically everything, because usually it does, but then one of these steps requires cool, so that was mildly, mildly ridiculous. You will have noticed that of the of the cards that are going in here, most of them are energy cards, but we also had a couple of material ones as well. So those are being made over here in this general tower of doom, and we've got so we've got the uh, that's not the pressure data. There is so pressure data and fiery data being made over here somewhere, and those are all being stolen. Here we go. Here's the fire data. So this is currently stopped um, due to a lack of iridium products. Um, but in theory, when it comes out, when it's passed out here, it will go up this bell. Oh, there's, there's still quite a bit of it available. It can be passed all the way up here, filter split off here, brought all the way up here, and then fed down this belt. And we can load it into a train over here. And this, this train essentially shuttles backwards and forwards between um, between here, the material science, and then it will go over to drop off uh, a thousand at a time, because 500 in this wagon, 500 in the other, of each of the data cards over for the matter science when it's required. It's also supposed to be getting pressure data, which is made up here and passed out. But again, we've run out of the um, the iridium product because, well, I followed this back a little bit, and it turns out a lot of these iridium products are being made in places like this where... 
Um, this is relying, it's relying on a supply of iridium plates coming in from here. And if we follow this back, hmm, I was going to say that we fo we find that the iridium plates are being produced from a uh, from a delivery cannon because I thought I found one earlier. But actually, that appears to be wrong. I have a somewhat maligned um, mic there. It's just that there's no iridium being brought up here. It's not that the design is the, the design is not wrong. It is merely not being provided with the materials it needs. So that's something that can hopefully be fixed without too much difficulty. I won't look into it now, but there should just be a train coming straight over from the um, Iridium. Oh, right, I, have to, I take it back. I will look into it now. Here we are, Kothar. Okay, so Kothar has... There's, there's not enough Iridium coming through. And Mike has been working on that. So it's, it's just a straight-up supply issue. That's fine. We can deal with that um, later. The final thing I'd like to talk about regarding the uh, material science there is that I also had ran into some problems with the, um, with the with the blank data cards that's required. So we've got oodles of the red circuits at the moment, and oh, actually, look, it looks like everything is caught up. Wow, that's 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 amazing. So we had we had all kinds of problems with the with, it, with insufficient rough data substrates being brought in to make all the data cards, and therefore we w we're running out over here. Uh, now, a large part of the reason we had this problem was because some muppet uh, decided it'd be a good idea to pull out many many thousands of each of the different types of catalogues. Yes, that Muppet is me. Um, and that means that I reckon, I, I did the maths uh, very, very approximately and reckoned that I pulled about 100,000 memory blank data cards worth of catalogues out of the system and stockpiled them all in these warehouses and then started making them into modules. So that was a sudden drain of 100,000 memory cards and that is a lot. And so essentially the system has been scrabbling ever since to try and catch up again. The problem arises because there were very the, the, there's a bit of a hierarchy based on distance. So because we're not using LTN, the trains deliver based on distance. So the first first memory card first memory cards will go to go, will go to here then, um, because it's closest. Then they'll go to here. Then I think probably here here. And then eventually they'll finally be taken over to the um, matter to the material sciences over here, and so it took a very very long time to fill up all the buffers again to the point where there were enough memory cards over here in the material science area, and we could actually start making those uh, data cards. Fortunately, we've now got to that point. Everything is as you can see. I have I have never seen. Well, I've, I I can't remember when I last saw this belt not flowing. Um, as you can see over here, we've got 86 stacks in each of the uh, each of these warehouses. The, tr the the train, I don't know why the train hasn't come back over here, actually. Um, oh, because there's another train. That train with the flat batteries is blocking its way out. That's why. Um, so, yes, this has now actually got us to the point of having enough memory cards. I am frankly astounded. I, I didn't. I, I never thought I would see the day. <laughs> there have been a couple of things we've done, though, to help, to, to give this a little bit of a helping hand. Uh, one of the more recent ones was over here. We've told both of these these spaceship systems, so these ones that go off to get the the asteroid data and the spaceship that's gone, and the um, the solar data and the spaceship that's actually here, have now been told to only fill up to five probes, which means we're not making quite as many. Which means this carrot catches up a little bit sooner. We only need to have uh, when we have ten in here and ten in here. So now we're not pulling through quite as many uh, memory cards here. Also, Tristan turned the station off because they were we, this was hogging enormous numbers of them, and it doesn't really need to. But now. Now that we've caught up there, we can turn this back on again and just get the get the buffers filled back up again, which would be quite nice. More importantly, I think, I put in a second train that does the, the loop from here down to the ground. So it goes from somewhere up here, yes, fr from this station here, it goes down the elevator, goes into the station here, will then fill up with uh, blank data substrates and, and, and a few other things like a bit of copper, that sort of thing, and then we'll shoot off back to go back up, up top again. And I put it, as I say, I put in a second one of those, and that's probably going to be, yeah, it's probably, it's this, this, it'll be this one over here blocking up the, um, the station over here, sorry about it. No, it's not. It's not that one either. I don't know where it's gone then. So it, there's, there's now two trains doing, doing the route around here. In order to make sure we don't get two trains trying to get into this station at the same time, we've got a train limit of one on the station. And that means if there's a train parked in this station when the other train comes up through the elevator, it would then stop here, blocking the exit to the elevator and jamming up all of the Norvis Norbit traffic and causing an incredible traffic jam and all kinds of problems. So, I've put in an additional station down here, which is just a temporary stop uh, that allows the rough data substrate train to come in here and wait here if there's another one in the, st in the other station, and if not, then they can come around and get and go into it. So it, it just means there's somewhere for the extra train to park. Nice and simple. Solves that problem. However, the eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that we don't seem to have any data substrates coming through here, and that is because two trains is actually faster than we seem to be capable of pulling them through. So a train, ah, a train has just arrived here, so it's unloading, and now the, the uh, date, rough data substrates are pouring down these underground belts, and will fairly soon start to pour, pour into that train. So it will then be filled up and then fairly soon be ready to leave. But it seems that the system 
either the, the jet production system or the logistic system on down on the ground is not capable of keeping up with the rate we've been ripping through them. That said, having looked up in space, we are currently okay and therefore we don't really need to bring a second, we, we don't need to worry about this too much. We've got enough of them now up in space that it's not a problem that we've used them all up down on the ground. I am now wondering what's going to happen to the other train um, when, when the whole thing catches up and gets into, into sort of an idle position. I have a horrible feeling it's going to end up waiting in here, but I guess we'll find out. The substrates are still being churned out at a decent rate over here, as you've seen before. This belt seems to have jammed up, interestingly. Um, oh, we have too much scrap being produced. That's an interesting problem to have. Uh, I'll have to follow that one. But yeah, so we've got we've got a reasonable supply of it being produced. If we look at this station, we do... Okay, we, do, we have significantly less than a train's worth available over here, though. Now, part of that is going to be because one of the... One and a half of these has stopped working. Um, but also... I think it might just be that the train is taking it. The train, we're using it up fast and it's being produced, essentially. So let's have a look at why the um, why the scrap isn't being dealt with as quickly as we would like. I assume it's just due to sheer overload. Yes, why are you not running? You're too... Oh, you're full of oil. Right, so the problem over here is that we have too much heavy oil because these pipes aren't linked to anywhere. So I think... Oh, no, no, they come, it comes out over here. Ah, <laughs> yes, these pipes are empty. These pipes are not. So what we need to do to fix this is put that there and then that there. But it won't go there. So that's not going to work. So we can't do that. I guess we need to um, put in an underground belt here. Like that. And then a piece of pipe in the middle of there. And then it'll... Yeah, or, or just anywhere else, actually. I don't know why I did it there. I could have done it here. I should have done it down here. That would have made a bit more sense. And get the, got the pipe. It meant the flow would have been a slightly shorter distance. But anyway, once we've, once we've, once we've fixed that and linked the two sides together, we're at, least, we're, at least that will allow us to double the amount of the rate we're, we're dealing with the scrap at. Uh, it's, it might be sufficient then. It might not. I suspect it still probably won't be. But I guess we'll see. Okay, so I have waffled on a little bit longer than I really intended to about all of that, but um, I think that's been quite a good, quite a nice coverage of how we've got the modules and the matter science up and running now, and how things are actually working, and we've, we've made progress by, well, very nearly another science pack. I mean, technically I haven't actually made any of those science packs yet, but they have been researched, and so we are ready to start producing them, and then once they have been, we can do all of these things across here, and won't that be fun? Uh, and that is, of course, a step that's required on the way to getting onto the deep space sciences, so we'll uh, we'll now be able to send somebody off to go and investigate Naquium at some point in the in, in the next stream or two, so that'll be exciting. And we're going to get better, we're going to get nanomaterials, better explosives, better fiery things, better spaceships, and many, many other things besides. This is going, all going to be interesting, and uh, lots of stuff to do here. So, as always, thank you very much for watching. I hope you'll come back on Monday for the second half of this video, where I shall be uh, talking about what everyone else has been doing, because this one was rather Lawrence-centric. I apologise for that, but I have been up to quite a lot in the, in the in the last stream. I feel like I've made some big progress. Things are going quite well, so I wanted to talk about it in quite a lot of detail. Also, please come and join us tomorrow, where, on Sunday, when we will be having a Warptorio supporter stream again. So this is we're going to be continuing from where we got to last time, uh, playing Warptorio, which is the game where you, uh, you you build up your factory until the biters get too scary, then you pick it all up again, get onto this little platform in the middle and teleport off to a new planet and start all over again. Well, not start all over again, because you've got some of the stuff you made before. So if you're a channel supporter, you're welcome to come and play with us. If you're if you're not a channel supporter, please come along and watch, because it should be good fun. It was very popular last time. It was a great, had a great time. It was a, a nice palette cleanser from, um, from playing uh, Space exploration because it feels very very different then on tuesday i shall be streaming uh, xcom 2 uh, we're carrying on things are going fairly well there i think we haven't had anyone killed for a very long time touch wood uh, we did fail we failed a few missions recently but things have started to get a little bit better um, we've only had a few people injured <clears throat> and then we'll be back on thursday with some more uh, factorio k2se streaming as well so i hope to see you around for all of that and thanks for watching see you around bye bye